Welcome to the Pure Passion Podcast with Dr. David Kyle Foster. This podcast and our many other resources are made possible by our donors. Please support this ministry by going to our website, masteringlife.org. Welcome to Pure Passion. Today we have a wonderful guest. She's been a friend for several decades now and uh, just an exquisite minister and author. Uh, we're going to be talking about her book, uh, Angels Are For Real. I love the title because mm-hmm. a lot of people, you know, kind of wonder about that and that sort of will wake them up, I think. Judith yeah. McNutt, thank you for being here. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm delighted, David, to be with you today. Thank you for inviting me. Judith and her husband, Francis, uh, founded Christian Healing Ministries how many years ago? Uh, it was in 1980. Wow. Wow. Wow, 40, 41 years, yes. Yeah. And you, your specialty has been healing and inner healing and those sorts of things. Yes, all the different types of healing. Yes, Wonderful. especially inner healing. Well, it's kind of the four kinds of healing that Francis talked about in his book, Healing. We pray for physical healing and inner healing and spiritual healing and deliverance. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And you have a, a base there in Jacksonville, Florida, and people can come for seminars and things? Yes, we relocated the ministry here in 1987, and we have a, a little place on the north side of Jacksonville where people come. We always say, David, it has two wings to the ministry. It has a training, which we run our schools of healing prayer and give seminars and conferences. And the other wing is uh, people come in and receive prayer for healing. So it's really just training and praying for people for healing. Well, it was a great privilege for me when you invited me to uh, to lecture there uh, many years well, yeah, ago. Yeah. And then, of course, we hosted you and Francis for a conference at uh, Church of the Messiah. Yes. And I then we also that. did a conference with John and Paula Sanford and the two of you in downtown Jacksonville. What a great thing that was. That was a great, co- that was on marriage and relationships. That was a great conference. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody still talks about that one. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> well, yeah. what caused you to write a book on angels? Did you have an experience of angels or what was going on? You know, it kind of goes back to, uh, I had not had an experience like directly seeing an angel or anything, but uh, Francis and I were in London at Holy Trinity Brompton Mm -hmm. and uh, John Wimber was giving a conference and invited us to pop in. So we did. And he had the prophets with him. If you remember during that time when he had the prophets and he invited us back backstage afterwards to receive prayer and there was all these different prophets were there, but this one young man walked up to me, and I guess he was in training or something to be a prophet, and he prayed over me, and he said, you're meant to write a book, and it's a prophetic revelatory book, and then he said, it's on angels, and I smiled because I had a contract on my desk back in the States from Baker Books to do a book on angels. But my children were fairly young then, and I had decided to postpone it. Mm. And that young man was John Paul Jackson. Oh, wow. I had no idea who he was, and he wasn't really very well known then. So anyway, it was about, well, it was only a few years ago that I finally felt God say, you need to do this now. My people need to know that they're not alone. They yeah. have angels watching over them. Yeah. Yeah. So but that meant so much to me after going through a almost death myself this year and uh, just knowing that there were heavenly hosts uh, aiding me and surrounding me. It was just special. And then to have it confirmed in your book was quite wonderful. It's, uh, that is true. You know, I think angels are very active in hospitals. <laughs> and, and surgical suites i really yeah. do well i don't know if i had a nurse angel i did have a nurse ratchet angel oh you ratchet. did <laughs> but i had <laughs> lots of good ones so well let's get into your book i especially want to uh go into chapter two where you describe what angels are and what their primary responsibilities are 
and you gave us 10. And yes. uh, starting with number one, uh, to return with Jesus. Uh, yes. That's one of their main purposes. Isn't yes. It? They will return with him. You know, it says that he'll return. I know the book of Revelation talks about it. He'll return uh, with Michael, the, the great archangel that is assigned to cast Satan into the pit, mm. as we call it. Uh, so, so he, yeah, there'll be, you know, uh, I heard someone recently say that the, the cloud that kind of carried Jesus back into heaven at the ascension, that, that really was angels. And I believe that when he returns, it said it will just be thousands and thousands of angels that return with him. And then they kind of go throughout the earth. You know, they'll have assignments to deal with the end time. So it's, yeah, it's very exciting uh, yeah. to think about all that. And, and then they're also here to guard, guard the church. How do they do that? Well, the, yeah, the, you know, I believe, and, and this is tradition in the church, too, that each and every one of us uh, has a guardian angel, hmm. and they're assigned to us, I believe, at conception, and they stay with us throughout their lives, our lives, guarding us and protecting us. I've often said some people's angels probably ask for a reassignment because they're out there on the edge so much, <laughs> but... I, I think they took shifts with me. <laughs> I think they took shifts with you. <laughs> yeah, they probably said, my time's up. Couldn't get a, you know, bring another angel. But you know, there's that scripture. I love it where uh, Jesus is calling Nathaniel and he told him he saw him under the tree. And Nathaniel said, oh, my Lord and my king and all that. And it's all, it's a little bit of humor on the part of Jesus. He says, uh, you think that's something. He said, you just wait. He said, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's so beautiful because you see the involvement that the angels had with the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We get glimpses of it when they came and ministered to him yeah. after the 40 days in the wilderness and certainly in the garden before his passion. Mm. Uh, that they were always there taking care of him, I think, through his earthly journey. And I believe they take care of the church. They're guiding and protecting the church from, from demonic attack and from evil. And the idea of a guardian angel, I guess the classic uh, scripture is when Peter knocks on the door. Tell us about that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When P Peter was released from prison. That's another little bit of humor I caught in the scripture. I love looking for humor in the scripture. But, you know, he's been released from prison. An angel walks him all the way to the main gate of the city. And the gate just flings open in front of him. And then the angel leaves him. And he goes on to the house where they're praying. This is what's so funny. They're praying for his release from prison. And he's standing at the door knocking. And the maid goes to the door and kind of looks through the little peephole. And she slammed it back and came back and said, I think Peter's at the door, instead of opening the door to let him in. And then one of the people that are praying, they're there praying, said, that couldn't be Peter. That has to be his angel. Mm. And you get a little glimpse there that maybe sometimes angels took on the appearance of the person they were guarding. Mm, yeah. So maybe, maybe in the early church that they knew that and we don't. Well, my first encounter with an angel was when I was 16. Oh, tell me. And I was at Royal Gorge in Colorado in that bridge that is the highest bridge in America over a cav over a, what do you call it? Um, Anyway, there's a train like thousands of feet below, and um, uh, and I was going to take my life. I was very uh, uh, disturbed at the time, didn't yeah. feel loved, and that. So my parents were standing next to me, and I thought, I'm going to take my life, and then they'll love me. Then they'll wish they had loved yeah. me. Uh, and so I start to mount the rail to jump, and this hand just pushes me back. Oh. And I didn't see anything, but it was definitely a hand pushing me back. It was a hand. Yeah. So that was my uh, 
That's an angel. That's an unseen angel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, then they come to execute judgment on the earth, the angels, and people don't like to talk about that. They only want the positive side these days. So tell us, what are they going to do with that? Well, the Bible really says that they will, uh, that's one of their roles is to execute judgment, but it also says they'll separate out, you know, the, the ones for heaven and the ones for, he for hell, really. And there's a separation and I think I wish more people would take that seriously, you know, because it, it is part of the final judgment that they will help carry out. Mm. Wow. Yeah. But, yeah. This is uh, quite an image when you think about it. You know, when I was first saved, I mean, the first week I was casting out demons out of myself. because <laughs> so I didn't yeah. have any Christians around me who knew anything about anything. So I'm just casting them out of myself because the Lord told me to. He said to name the temptation, wow. uh, name the angel according to what it was tempting you to do, and then tell it to go where Jesus, well, before he told me that. So I'm casting out these angels, and I'm casting them into the lake of fire in wow. my prayers. And the Lord stops me, and he says, uh, you can't do that. That's something the angels are going to do in the last time. Oh, he, so when he, you're he. casting them into the lake of fire, you're sending them nowhere. And so I said, uh, where should I send them, Lord? And he said, tell them to go where Jesus sends them. And you said yeah. that very thing in your book, what he had uh, revealed to you as well. I know, I know. It, it's really true. You know, and you know, when we pray for someone, like at our healing center, I learned that from Francis years ago. He said, just send, send them to Jesus. If there's some demonic, you know, activity, just send them to Jesus because he's the one. He's the judge. Yeah. He, he always said that we kind of become like, how did he say that? It was like if we're, if we're constantly casting them out and sending them to hell, it does something to us because then we become a judge and we become harsh. Harsh, he, yeah. I just want to send him to Jesus and he can deal with them. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I like that a lot more. Yeah. Well, the angels, another point you made is the angels give the law. Describe how that happened. Well, I believe that's all the way back in scripture that they, you know, they were very instrumental in, in giving the law early, uh, like in Genesis and their Exodus and some of the earlier books. And I do believe that part of their role now is to guide the church in terms of uh, law, in terms of uh, holiness. You know, I think one of the things I remember Thomas Aquinas said, you know, he wrote volumes uh, on the angels. He, I think it was like seven volumes. Really? Hatton. Francis brought, he had them in his office uh, when I was researching and he brought them home and he kind of stacked them on the table where I was working. And I heard him laughing as he was walking away. And I thought, why is he laughing? Because I was so excited to get these books. And I went in and opened them and they were all in Latin because Francis did all his seminary training in Latin. So he had these volumes of Thomas Aquinas. But anyway, he had to translate a lot for me because I couldn't read it. But one of the things Aquinas said is that angels enlighten us. Like they, they give us, like if we're praying for guidance or praying to know discernment, they enlighten us, they give us wisdom. So I think that's part of what he meant with the law, that they give us the law, mm. that they enlighten us and direct us ah, in yeah. the ways to live and to run the church and Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, what have you ever speculated about what the lake of fire is and where it is? And... Well, I remember I read Dante's Divine Comedy, you know, when I was in high school. That that kind of made me think for the first time. And of course, I grew up in a denomination where there was a lot of talk about hellfire and brimstone, you know, which is always really scary to a little girl. But no, I, I've always believed that the, the whole spiritual dimension is like all around us. When yeah. Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is, is coming up on you, you know, like that it's all around us. And I think it's, uh, 
it's like a, a, a thin space. It's like, like I talked about in the last chapter between uh, this world and the next world. And so where the lake of fire is, you know, who knows? And where the fullness of heaven is, who knows? I mean, mm. there's people that have had experiences uh, going to both and they've written about it. And it's, it's interesting, but you know, it's one person's experience. So mm. I don't know how much I try not to deviate a whole lot from scripture, yeah. you know, when I'm forming my own theology or, or God's theology, it's not mine. Um, but I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I was reading the other day, somebody thinks it's the sun, which is literally a lake of fire. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So another uh, purpose of the angels is to exalt, worship, and glorify God. That's my favorite. Uh, what's that. going on in heaven with that? I think, I think about that a lot. We have a wonderful worship leader here. And uh, there's times when we're worshiping. She does a lot of our conference worship for us and some of our schools. And we believe in always really worshiping God before we go into a meeting or you know, start the healing time because the worship just, it just ushers in the presence of God, especially that corporate worship. But I've, I've been, oh, I'll tell you, I'm not sure it was in that was, well, anyway, I'll tell the story. When I was traveling, I traveled across uh, America and back through Canada when I was younger speaking on behalf of Israel after I lived there spoke mostly in churches and synagogues, homes. But this one night we were in a home and this woman was leading worship. She just had a guitar and she was leading worship. And, you know, I've been around churches. I knew all the current songs. You know how we all kind of sing all the same worship songs. And I didn't know one song that she was singing and they were so anointed. So I went over to her after the meeting was over, my friend and I, and I said, did you write all those songs? I said, they're just so amazing, the worship. She said, no, I, I got them in the desert. And I said, what do you mean you got them in the desert? And she said, well, I used to love to take my guitar and walk into the desert around, it was either sunrise or sunset. And she said, I would just sit out there and worship God. And then she said, one day, uh, I heard angels singing and it was like a whole host of angels were worshiping God and they were allowing her to be a part of it. And she actually recorded the songs and then she oh. wrote them down and she was going around, you know, sharing them with people. And she did send me a tape and I can't believe it, but I lost it. Uh, but the songs were incredible. And, you know, sometimes we're in meetings, uh, especially larger conferences, well, not huge, but, you know, two, 300 people. And suddenly it's like the, the volume increases and there's more voices and everyone will say the next day, the angels were singing with us mm. and they have very high, they have this range that's much higher than ours. Mm. So I, th I just think it's because they have so much practice, you know, <laughs> in heaven. <laughs> Have you ever heard uh, Jesse Duplantis' story of going to heaven? No. It is the most amazing story. Look it up on YouTube. Oh, and yeah. he says, when he entered the throne room of God, yeah. uh, there was just, you know, 10,000 times 10,000 angels, which is 100 million, by the way, I just mean, in the throne room of God. Oh my goodness. And um, they were flying around singing, holy, 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 you know, like it says in the scripture. Yeah. In the scripture. And he thought, you know, this is going on for eternity. I wonder if they ever get bored just oh, yeah. flying around saying the same thing. And uh, and the Lord says to him, no, because every time they fly around to the front of the throne, they see a new dimension of my glory. Wow. So it, their holy, holy, holy is renewed exponentially every time they go around. Isn't that beautiful? They got the best job in the world. They do. They do. <laughs> Yeah, okay, your next point was the angels act as God's messengers. Yes. And there's that famous story in Daniel where the angel was delayed. Talk about that one. I love that one. Uh, that's always been one of my favorites, even before I thought about writing on it. 
because you kind of see the function of angels there because uh, Daniel is praying for an interpretation of this vision that he'd had. And when the angel finally does come, he, he, there's several things. He first says, oh, Daniel, highly esteemed of God, you know, so he's always, angels are always validating our, God's love for us. Mm. I think that's so beautiful. Mm. But then he said, from the first moment you started to pray, like you turned your heart to God, it's from that first moment I was sent with an answer, you know, to your prayer, but I was held up on my way by this larger demon. And then Michael comes, or Gabriel, I think it was Michael. Yeah, it was Michael, I think. Yeah, Michael comes and takes over the warfare and lets this messenger angel go on to Daniel. So there's a hierarchy of angels, definitely. And some are just involved in spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, some are involved in healing. Some are messenger angels. And so that one was a messenger angel, but he wasn't quite ready to deal with whatever a large demonic force that was right. that he had to contend with. So we have, so the angels have specialties just like we do. They do. Uh, yeah. They do. Yeah, there's angels that worship, there's angels that bring messages, there's the warfare ones. I've always, uh, when I teach on it, I, I present the three kinds that we think most commonly of as following the three streams of the gospel. Like you've got uh, Gabriel, who is uh, in charge of all the messenger angels. He's the great archangel. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, Michael that we just mentioned. He's in charge of spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is Raphael. Mm -hmm. who is mentioned in the Apocrypha, in the Book of Tobit. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that's involved in healing. Mm -hmm. So you have all three streams of what Jesus taught us in the gospel. You know, the good news and, and spiritual warfare and the, what was the other one? Uh, yeah, spiritual warfare and healing. Yeah. yeah. So quite a host helping us. I mean, they're, they're sent yeah. to help us, the Bible says, right? They are. They're yeah. sent to help us, yes. And there's nine, nine choirs of them, according to, was it Dionysius the Areopagite yes. back in 500 yeah. AD? I'm glad you said that, that I didn't have to. Yeah, because <laughs> when I had to give talks right after my book came out, I kind of left his name out because it was, it's hard to pronounce. One of those earlier names. But yes, he talked about the nine choirs early on. Um, in the early church. And it was a surprise to me uh, when I studied, to, did the research to write the book. Uh, but it's, it's very traditional, like in the Roman Catholic Church especially, that these were accepted early on as yeah. the different, different categories of angels, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's uh, sets of threes. You got your seraphim, your cherubim, your thrones. And the seraphims are called the burning ones. I love that. Don't you love that? Yeah. And yeah. their job is just to worship. Is that it? To worship. It, it just said, I remember it says they live in the deepest heart of God. And it's like they're flames of love. And when I was writing that, I, I just started weeping because it was so beautiful and it was so powerful and I remember saying Lord that's where I want to be I want to be in the deepest heart mm. they are called the burning ones yeah, yeah. and it's then the cherubim uh, they were standing at the gate of the Garden of Eden what all do yeah. they do well the cherubim of course the most famous one uh, you know it's, it's funny the at Christmas time and growing up the, the cherubim are always these fat little angels, you know, that we hang on our Christmas trees and then kind of, you know, half naked. And that there's not an angel in the universe that looks like that. So, you know, we have these really bad images out there. But uh, Satan was actually uh, a, a cherubim. And he was the one, it says in tradition that he reflected the glory of God. Mm. And he was in the throne room. 
And then of course he rebelled and was cast out of heaven along with a third of the angels mm. that were with him. That's now the, the demons, mm. but they're under his control. But he was a great cherubim. Mm. They're, they're, they're also the throne room angels, the cherubim mm. are throne room. Um, so yeah, and then and the thrones. That's just what is a throne? I, I don't understand that title. It's just, yeah, it's just the name that, that was given uh, to that particular type. They guard the throne of God. Mm. And so they're called thrones. Mm. It'd be like a chess game, you know, some of the names on a chess board. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah, knights and those different things. And then the second set of three of the nine choirs is having to do with things going on on the earth or what? what is... Yes, it's basically uh, the physical universe that the second category is more over the physical universe, the earth, you know, the planets, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars. Sometimes in scripture, uh, stars are like in the book of Revelation. Sometimes when it says stars, those are angels mm -hmm. interpreted angels. So they're they're literally over the physical universe to take care of it. Uh, and guard it principalities maybe well yeah they're they're uh principi principalities um what what was it let's see i've got the little list here yeah well, got... the dominions powers and authorities yeah. are the that second level okay and they're the earth and then the third order is principalities uh -huh. and archangels and angels and they're directly involved in human affairs so they're assigned to us so if the people who saw angels in the bible fell like dead men on the on the ground at the very first order uh, that yeah. tells you what we're about to face when we see the seraphim and the cherubim i know well you know some of those uh descriptions in the old testament you know, with so many wings and wheels turning and fire coming out of them. And I'm like, that was kind of a human's way of trying to describe the awesomeness of it. Yeah. Um, and like John, uh, the apostle John on the island of Patmos, you know, when, when an angel appeared to him, he fell at his feet mm -hmm. and the angel said, get up. I'm, I'm, only, I'm only an angel. You can't worship me. Mm -hmm. You worship God alone. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's always my concern is that so many, not that people get in, although they did in the early church, Paul admonished them not to worship angels. Mm -hmm. So some of them had obviously seen angels. Yeah. And it, they're so awesome when you see them. It's just, yeah, yeah, you want to worship them. They're so supernatural and otherworldly. And with yeah. Satan presenting himself as an angel of light, no wonder people in the new age and so forth end up worshiping them. They do. The fallen ones. He always comes on as an angel of light. That's He makes everything very appealing, mm -hmm. like sin. Mm -hmm. And he, you don't see that. It's, it's like somebody who has an affair during their marriage. At first, I've worked with so many people that have, and at first, they say oh, it was so beautiful in the beginning, mm -hmm. you know. And I said, sin always is beautiful in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's when it hooks you and pulls you, you know, down to hell itself that it becomes very ugly and dirty and all that. So yeah, Satan, he's a master, master of that. Yeah, just like a lot of politicians. I, but I won't go there. <laughs> yeah. So number seven in your. Uh, primary responsibilities of angels as to, is to act as guardians and to protect. And that's us, I assume. That's, yes, to protect us. That's what happened to you. You know, mm -hmm. the angel that put its hand out and stopped you. It's interesting, David, how many car accidents they, they stop. Yeah. Like I had so many stories of car accidents and I just did a, uh, I don't even know what to call it, a partial writing of a, a book for Guidepost. They're coming out, and I think it's January with a book 
on angels and I did the introduction to the chapters and introduced the book and all that. And uh, when they wrote me, they said they had the angel stories because they had gone out. They'd sent two editors out to get them. And one of the things they said is, please don't get any more car accidents that were prevented by angels. So it made me laugh because I had a whole bunch of those from people that wrote me. Yeah. So it's like they're very active in terms of protecting us yeah. from falls and car accidents and yeah. all the things we tend to get into as humans. And a kind of a related thing they do is they bring healing. I mean, I know in your book, you tell lots of wonderful stories of angels yeah. walking up to sick people and just putting their hands on them and, and healing I them. I know. It's, it's true. They really do carry uh, healing in, in their presence. They just, mm -hmm. you know, because they're filled with God's love mm -hmm. and they, they function perfectly and purely under his authority. So when they show up, they're this, they're radiant. I mean, they're just radiant with mm. light and they carry so much of his presence, which is mm. healing. His mm. presence is healing. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I wish we had more time. Um, I just recommend highly, highly that people read your book because it's so inspiring. The Holy Spirit's all over it. And yeah. um once again, uh, Judith you. is the head of Christian Healing Ministries in Jacksonville, Florida, yeah. and it's a great place to go for inner healing prayer and conferences and seminars and things. And what's the what's the web address? Yes, it's Christian Healing. Well, if they put in Christian Healing Ministries, it'll probably come up if it's under McNutt. Uh -huh. But it's Christian Healing Men M I N mm -hmm. dot org mm -hmm. O R G. So that, that's the way to, to really Google it, is Christian Healing, M-I-N. Okay. So, yes, thank you. you. Got any other books in the works? Well, there's actually two angel books. I don't know if you knew that. There's a second one. Oh, yes. Uh, called, what is it? I've got it right here. I forgot the I title, though. The second one. The first one. Encountering Angels. Encountering Angels. And that one... I actually wrote that one. Baker Books wanted it, but I wrote it because I had so many wonderful angel stories. I thought I've got to let people read these stories. And the first one is more research and what is an angel and all of that, but mm -hmm. it has stories too. Mm -hmm. uh, but the second one is mostly stories. And people, I've got friends that read them to their children and read them to each other. And it's just so encouraging, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But yes, I'm actually meeting Friday with uh, my editor, and we're kind of exploring the next book. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be on some kind of healing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. Thank we're you. going to have Judith on again, this time talking about inner healing, which yeah. is like the core of, of a lot of what you do there at Christian Healing Ministry. Yes. So, yes. So, Good to have you on and God bless you all. You. Make sure you uh, be looking out for the inner healing interview with uh, Judith. It'll be coming up soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Remember, much of Dr. Foster's teaching has been taken from his new book entitled Sexual Healing Reference Edition, available at our website, masteringlife.org. This podcast and our many other resources are available because of our donors. If you are one of them, thank you. If you would like to join in supporting us, please visit masteringlife.org. 